Novus, the new voice. Vox Novus, the new dimension. Vox Novus, thought and movement leaders who will share from their experience and offer tools to help us navigate our rapidly changing world. My name is Victor Furman. Welcome to Vox Novus, the new voice. Within each of us is a spiritual longing that prompts us to unite with something greater than ourselves. Yet no matter the spiritual path we choose, we inevitably encounter our own shadow. How may we use spiritual shadow work to recover from spiritual betrayal and move from disillusionment to inspiration and from spiritual naivete to spiritual maturity? Returning as my guest on Vox Novus this week, Connie Zweig is known as the shadow expert. Connie Zweig is a retired psychotherapist and former executive editor at Jeremy P. Tarcher Publishing is co-author of Meeting the Shadow and Romancing the Shadow, and author of the bestseller The Inner Work of Age, Shifting from Role to Soul, and a novel, A Moth to the Flame, The Life of the Sufi Poet Rumi. She's been practicing and teaching meditation for more than 50 years. Her website is ConnieZweig.com, and she joins me this week to share her path and latest book, Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, the Dance of Darkness and Light in Our Search for Awakening. Please join me in welcoming back to Vox Novus, Connie Zweig. Welcome back, Connie. Thank you, Victor. Really appreciate it. Connie, for our listeners meeting you for the first time, please share with us your path and how it led to you becoming known as the Shadow Expert. Oh, gosh, that's a long story. I became interested in the work of Carl Jung Um, in the 1990s. I was working in the publishing industry, and I put together an anthology called Meeting the Shadow, which was a collection of um, expert thinkers about the dark side of human nature. And it was a big hit, and I realized that there was a need for deeper understanding um, among some people. And I uh, was in Jungian analysis at the time and studying myself and had some dreams about the shadow that were really my own shadow that were really significant for me. And a few years later, um, we sold the publishing house and I decided to go back to grad school to get my doctorate in depth psychology and study Jung more officially. So after that, I became a psychotherapist for about 30 years and helped people, guided people to orient to the unconscious or the shadow. And during that time, I wrote Romancing the Shadow, which developed a method for working with our unconscious process in relationships. So if our listeners ever have the same repetitive fight over and over again, or they find themselves engaging in behaviors that they can't understand, like why do, why am I criticizing my husband, or why am I struggling with alcohol or food, whatever the self-sabotaging behavior, that's about the shadow erupting, the part of us that's outside of conscious awareness, and that sabotages our conscious intentions. And so I wanted to really assist people, guide people to make the unconscious more conscious. And then later in my 60s, I was looking for material about the shadow and aging, and I couldn't find any anywhere. So I began to research and study and wrote the inner work of age, shifting from role to soul, which is about how to work with the shadow or the unconscious issues around growing older. And the new book extends that exploration into the spiritual and religious worlds and how we meet the shadow in ourselves or in our clergy and teachers in the spiritual arena. And when you were on last time, we were talking about work of inner age. For those of us who have 
uh, let's let's say welcome the golden years. Just give us a brief synopsis of what they can find in that book. Well, the inner work of age explores internalized ageism, which leads us to dislike aging in ourselves, to feel uncomfortable with our bodies and struggle with self-acceptance as we age, whether it's our image or letting go of work and our familiar roles, or whether it's about illness or spiritual practice. And it guides people to use the circumstances of their aging for inner work, for grist for the mill, as Ramdas called it. And so for people who want a more self-knowledge, more self-acceptance, and deeper meaning and connection to spirituality in later life, I would say in midlife and beyond, that's what the book is for. It's kind of like a rite of passage to become an elder and to really shift our awareness in relation to our age. Absolutely. One of the things that I found personally is having continuous purpose. The purpose may have changed, but my day job, my career in uh, technology for 44 years and industry for 44 years, my spiritual career, working with the Interfaith Temple, and then a return (laughs) to the day job, so to speak, in January of 2022, for which I'm grateful that I've been there now for almost a year and a half uh, working with technology again. So that purpose has always been there. Yes. And for some people, you know, the purpose can be different. So for some people, it's about uh, more work or a different kind of work. For some people, it's about service and contributing to the common good. For some people, it's about grandparenting. For others, it's about activism, social justice issues. And for some people, it's more inner work, you know, more meditation practice or finding a different uh, religious community or a different prayer practice. And so purpose might not look the same for everyone. One of the things I realized, that book has a lot of practices in it, and one of the practices is life review. And when I did my own life review, one of the things I realized was that my deeper purpose, which I call my soul's mission, was transmitting information about consciousness. And that deeper purpose has been involved with every career, all of my four careers. So even though they look different from the outside, my careers, internally, they actually had the same purpose. I totally understand and agree with you because from a retrospective, uh, most of my career, whether it be industry or in spiritual work, uh, always had that spiritual component within. Yeah, and that's that's different for different people. So I'm not prescribing, you know, what kind of purpose people need. Rather, I'm saying that there's a quality of awareness as an elder that we can bring to whatever we do. And it allows us to experience a different identity. So one of the shadow characters in the age book is the doer. If we continue to identify with the doer, as we did in midlife, then we lose something precious about the deeper purpose of becoming an elder. And if we bring the qualities of an elder into our doing in later life, there's more internal freedom, less attachment, um, more connection to something beyond ego, something larger than ourselves. And so that inner shift, I call it a shift from role to soul, that inner shift is hidden to other people. They can't see it in our, they just see our doing. But what I'm talking about happens in the inner world. And it gives us a different subjective experience of whatever it is we're doing or not doing in the moment. What inspired your new book, Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, the Dance of Darkness and Light in Our Search for Awakening. When I was in my 20s, I started meditation at age 19. And in my 20s, I began to see certain red flags in the community 
that were bothering me. Certain kinds of hypocrisy, um, hierarchies, and I, I felt like I was seeing lies. And so after a few years, I left that community and I was very heartbroken, disillusioned, um, didn't know if I could trust another teacher. And that led me on a whole different path. And I've interviewed many, many people who've had similar experiences, whether their minister lied to the church or their rabbi had an affair or their guru was financially coercive or their roshi had sex with a student. So in every denomination, teachers can act out their shadows around power, sex, and money. And this can be heartbreaking for people because we become very invested in the sacred relationship of student and teacher or parishioner and clergy person. And I wanted to offer people, again, a guide to the inner world in the shadow, what's happening in the unconscious when we're drawn to charismatic teachers and we witness abuse or even just subtle coercion. Maybe somebody is a teacher criticizes a student or shames someone or threatens expulsion if they don't obey. What is going on there in the shadow? What's going on in the teacher or clergy person that he or she is unaware of because it's unconscious, but that sets up this painful, um, potentially abusive situation? And so I began to study that and extend my research into uh, religion and spirituality. And then I discovered that there were many, many dozens of reports of scandals in contemporary communities. And I write about that in chapter five of the book. And I try to look at what are the patterns in these stories, again, across denominations. And I found that many communities repeat the patterns of alcoholic families where there's a narcissistic parent slash leader, there's some kind of coercion or abuse. Um, people are told to keep secrets, to hold the system together. Sometimes there's drug and alcohol abuse going on. And so if the student or believer was in this kind of alcoholic family, and then it begins to get repeated in the religious or spiritual community, there's a resonance, there's a familiarity in the shadow for that person. And that's one of the reasons they may be drawn to it. And it's one of the reasons they may get trapped and be unable to leave because they don't have the skill to become a whistleblower, to speak the truth. There's too much fear and shame about losing the precious teacher, the precious belonging, the sense of being special, the sense of being seen. It's a big investment. And so I really guide people with spiritual shadow work to begin self-reflection and to begin to look at what was lost in the relationship, what was given up in that relationship to the teacher? What parts of the self were sacrificed? And do you want to, and once you begin to uncover that and explore the consequences, then to begin to contemplate the decision about separation. And I'm not taking a position here. This is not a book about cults, you know, let's get everybody out and back into conventional life. That's not what I'm saying, because many, many religious and spiritual communities have great value and beauty and compassion and community for people. 
and transcendental transcendental experiences with the practices. And so, you know, many people stay because they're having deep spiritual insights. So that's another valid reason to stay. But on the other hand, if you're struggling with being abused or witnessing abuse, what are the costs to you? And so I'm trying to help people evaluate, learn discernment, how to see the red flags, how important they are to you, and evaluate whether you can act on your own behalf. And so there are stories in the book about communities that were able to redesign themselves once a scandal broke. So Kripalu Yoga Center and also the LA Zen Center both had sex scandals with the teachers and they were able to bring in consultants and redesign the systems so that the systemic issues that were colluding with the abuse were redesigned, were changed, and no longer supported the bad behavior. So there are examples of individual shadow work with teachers and students and how they were able to resolve some of their personal issues as well as the community issues. And so it's full of stories and interviews, and some of them might be difficult to read in terms of the scandals, but they're very educational because if we feel this longing for transcendence, for a union with the divine, it will guide us to a practice or a teacher or a community. And we want to be able to apply psychology. We don't want to have blind faith. We want to have enough self-knowledge and insight to be able to bring discernment to our spiritual life and cultivate shadow awareness in ourselves. What are our blind spots? And in our teachers, what are their blind spots? So that we can really have sacred relationships that support our development and that are not destructive to ourselves or others. From your research, why do so many clergy and or spiritual teachers in every denomination act out their shadows? Well, I think there are sort of layers of answers to this, Victor. For teachers who come from the East, there are cultural differences. Many of them come from monasteries where the messaging is sexist or misogynist. Women are a temptation. They're bad. They're evil. The body is evil. The impulses of the body, especially in celibate traditions, the impulses of the body come from the devil. And so all of that is repressed into the shadow. And then, and some of them also experience abuse. There's a Tibetan Buddhist teacher who just came out and said very publicly that there's a lot of molestation going on in the Tibetan Buddhist communities in Asia. So, you know, they have these cultural messages, they have their own trauma, they come here, and the women are very liberated. There's a lot of self expression. They're not dressed, you know, they're dressed very liberally. They want in some ways to be close to these teachers and to be special to them. And so there's a setup there between the shadow of the student and the shadow of the teacher. I'm using a male teacher and a female student, and that's not always the case. There are cases of abuse of same-sex students, and there are cases of abuse with women teachers. But the majority are male teachers and female students. So there are those cultural differences that can erupt in the context of Western liberalism and individualism. You know, there's this difference between communal life and the sort of individual heroic ego in the West. So there are lots of cultural differences. One of, one of the results of our individual heroic ego story in the West 
is that in the shadow is a need for dependency. And we're really taught um, as adults in the West not to express that very much, how we need other people and we need to rely emotionally on other people. And sometimes that emerges in, in students in spiritual and religious settings, and they want to be dependent, and they want to give up decision-making and financial independence and emotional independence, and they want to be taken care of. And so they're recreating their childhood in this relationship with this teacher slash parent. And so that's another issue that comes up. And if, if there's a lot of projection, so projection is unconsciously attributing to another person something that we deny in ourselves. So if we deny our own spiritual value or essence or light, and we project it out onto a priest or swami or roshi, then what happens is that person is carrying that light for us. And what happens if, and so that, that student then can become quite obedient and submissive um, out of fear of losing that relationship and out of the need to be close to that parental figure. But what happens on the flip side to the teacher if the teacher has hundreds or in India, some cases, millions of people projecting that light and that power and that perfection onto him or her, eventually the part of him that is repressed, that is not perfect, is going to act out because that is a burden to carry all that projection for so many people. It's quite, he it's a load. And so eventually that teacher will either, let's say with Osho Rajneesh, start relying on drugs or Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche become an alcoholic or in many other cases become verbally abusive and try to make distance from people and try to control his students more so that he doesn't lose the devotion because the devotion becomes like food to him. He needs it, and he can't bear the thought that people might leave. And at the same time, he's accumulating wealth, and the students are giving more and more money to him, and he becomes dependent on the income. I had someone recently tell me that the teacher started out asking for tithing, and then he wanted part of the student's income. And then when the student's parents died, he wanted him to turn over the estate to him. And so these teachers become, they feel entitled. They feel entitled to power and to the props of power, to money, to a Rolls Royce or a private jet or to property, and sometimes to sex. They feel entitled to sex with their students to prove their love and obedience to them. And so on both sides, there's projection going on and people get caught in a dynamic that's no longer healthy and that's no longer leading to spiritual experience, but is recreating early emotional patterns. My guest is Connie Zweig. Her new book, Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, The Dance of Darkness and Light in Our Search for Awakening. Connie, please tell our listeners where they can get this book and find out more about your work. So the new book is available on Amazon, barnesandnoble.com, anywhere you buy your books, books a million. You can find my workshops and other interviews on Connie Zweig. Dot com. There's lots of material there on um, both of my last two books. And I will be forming um, circles for people who want to do spiritual shadow work together. I did with the, with the age book and it was very um, successful. 
So if you want to read the inner work of age in community, you can send me an email to ConnieZweig at gmail.com. Put Wisdom Circle in the subject line and send me your time zone. These groups are free and they're online. If you want to do spiritual shadow work with others, put spiritual shadow work in the subject line and send me your time zone to ConnieZweig at gmail.com. And I'll connect you with other people for either of these kinds of groups. And we'll be back with more of Connie after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. The cutting edge of conscious radio. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Back on Box Novus, my guest this week is Connie Zweig. We're talking about her latest book, Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, The Dance of Darkness and Light in Our Search for Awakening. So, Connie, what you were describing in the first segment with these spiritual and religious leaders sounds like control. Well, in some cases, that's what shows up. And again, this is not, we're not speaking about everybody. We're talking about, you know, situations in which the shadow emerges in this sacred relationship. I call it power shadow, but it can take various forms of control and it can have various motivations. So if you have a religious, a priest, a minister, a swami, a sheikh, who is not aware of his or her own need for control, unconscious need for control, may have authoritarian tendencies, may have narcissistic or self-centered tendencies, then part of what may happen in a situation in which people are devoted and giving themselves over to this person doing all the work of service for the institution, praising this person a lot, believing what they're taught without questioning, without doubt, then what can happen in that leader is ego grandiosity. Rather than spiritual development, his ego starts to expand. And when that happens, there is more desire for control. If you look at, you know, teachers from the East, some of them are born into lineages being told how special they are. You know, they are the new teacher from the time they're born. And so they grow up with that sense of entitlement and specialness. And then they come here and they're being treated that way with all these props you know, whether they sit on a golden throne or in front of a giant Buddha or whatever the props, or we think of the props of the Catholic Church and the way that a priest is um, celebrated and treated as special. So if that person's psychology is not stable and there's no shadow awareness, there's no connection to the blind spots in that person, then what happens? Eventually, that person is going to act out. And, you know, in the 1980s, when we first started hearing about the scandals in the Catholic Church of child sexual abuse, we were also shocked. And everybody tried to understand, was it about celibacy? You know, was it about homosexuality? Was it about that these priests themselves were abused? You know, how do we understand that? And those scandals continue to this day. I mean, church dioceses still are paying off uh, many, many believers. And so if we look at the whole system of the Catholic Church, we can see that 
even though there are some segments of it that have tried to make ethical guidelines and in some cases punish priests, in the system as a whole, this has not been questioned enough to be corrected. The ordainment of women hasn't happened. The issue of celibacy hasn't been addressed. The widespread punishment hasn't become a deterrent. And so that happens on smaller scales in synagogues, in mosques, and in Eastern traditions where, you know, it might be a Sangha or a Zendo or a Buddhist monastery, a Buddhist community of some kind. And so I think what I'm trying to suggest, Victor, is that our expectation of a spiritual life that's all light and all bliss is naive. And that the human shadow is here and it's always going to be here. It's a part of who we are. And so how do we imagine a religious or spiritual life that includes the human shadow and shadow awareness? How do we cultivate shadow awareness and the blind spots in ourselves? So how do I see my own needs in this context and how they might set me up for abuse? Or as a teacher, how do I see my own needs or my own blind spots my own flaws and failings, so that I can protect myself and others in this situation. Part of what's happening today is that tens of thousands of people are having spiritual breakthroughs, and the word non-duality is being thrown around a lot in this domain. People are having insights into the community into the unity of all of life and those non-dual experiences then lead them to believe they're awake but those experiences are often fleeting they're state experiences it's a state of consciousness that's beautiful that comes and then it goes and so if a person becomes a teacher after a fleeting experience of non-duality. But that person has not explored psychological development and moral development. Then that person may be naive as a teacher and act out his or her shadow material. What I'm suggesting is that we can move from that naivete into a more mature kind of spirituality both as a teacher and a student, by adding shadow awareness to the process. What are people longing for when they seek a teacher or a practice? I call this the holy longing. And I believe that in the soul, in the deepest spiritual part of every human being, there is a longing for the divine. You know, the saints and poets speak about it as the soul's longing for the beloved. Christian mystics speak about it as the longing to be joined with Christ. Buddhists speak about it as the longing for awakening and emptiness. So there is this kind of universal yearning and this yearning for for transcendence, for an experience beyond ego is in every human being. It may not be conscious. There are many people who don't consciously feel that. But for people who do, they may live out this seeker part of them by following this longing. And it can lead them to beautiful practices and transcendent experiences. And often teachers who are highly valuable and who transmit compassion, and spiritual levels of consciousness. And on the other hand, the holy longing can lead us to teachers who abuse us, teachers who are not, who maybe have some kind of awakening, but are not aware of their own flaws and their own weak spots and shadows. 
And so the holy longing can lead us in positive directions and in dangerous, risky directions. And that's why I'm urging people to become aware of the shadow in this context. In your book, you talk about projection. How do you define projection? Well, in the last segment, I talked about how projection is an automatic mechanism. We all do it. It can't be avoided. It's the way that the shadow gets rid of unwanted traits and qualities, feelings, and behaviors by attributing them to other people. So if it's unacceptable to me to be lazy, I may look at someone and say, wow, she's really lazy couch potato. And I see it outside myself. If it's unacceptable for me to be, to connect to my own spiritual essence, then I'm going to project that outside of myself onto teachers and say, he's so enlightened or she's so compassionate, or he knows so much, I want that. Or she's like the perfect mother, and I don't have that in myself. And so, and so with projection, we can take material that's in our own shadow, that can be anything at all, because anything can be repressed that is unacceptable to our parents in early childhood, to our teachers, to our clergy, it gets stuffed into the shadow. And then it gets projected later in life. Maybe it's about sexuality. And we see someone who's really overtly sensual. And that looks repulsive to us because it's forbidden in ourselves. And so that mechanism plays out in the religious arena, when we give away our own spiritual power, or access, or loving kindness to another person. And what do we lose when we project that onto a clergy member or a teacher? Well, we lose that quality in ourselves. So for many people, there's a period of time when we need a guide. We need to do that projection. We need a mentor. This often happens in therapy. In therapy, it's called transference. A person comes to me and they project onto me the good mother that they never had. And so we work on that. And at a certain point in the relationship, I begin to hand that back to my client. I begin to allow that client to experience those qualities in herself or himself. But spiritual teachers are not trained to do that. And so they hold on to the projection because they start to get off on the power of it. And so the the student is left in the subordinate position without the power, without her own spiritual connection, without developing her own compassion or researching her own knowledge, gaining her own self self-awareness, because the teacher's carrying it for her or for him. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot that can be sacrificed in this projection. And if it lasts for a very long time, the person may sacrifice critical thinking because she's afraid to doubt the teacher. In some cases, you make a vow not to doubt the teacher, but to allow the teacher to carry the certainty and the decision-making for you. And so that is sacrificed. Critical independent thinking is sacrificed in the believer. Authentic feeling may be sacrificed. So often people need to develop a spiritual persona in a community. Everyone is supposed to look happy And so the range of feeling gets sacrificed because you can't express your sadness or your anger. Often the connection to the body gets sacrificed because the body is often shamed in religious settings. Sexual feelings, 
sensual feelings, even just sensations like gut intuition, gut instinct can get sacrificed because the body, the connection to the body is not supported. And personal agency, acting on our own behalf might be sacrificed because we get stuck in a dependent subordinate position. We're in service to this greater being who has the power and the agency. And that person is going to tell us how to live, what to eat, when to sleep, what to think, what not to think, what to feel, what not to feel. Otherwise, we're going to go to hell. Or we're going to have bad karma for lifetimes. Or our family is going to be punished. And so there's a lot of, as you said, control going on. Sometimes it's very implicit and covert. And sometimes it's overt, you know, in the messaging. So there's a lot being sacrificed by someone who becomes a true believer in this relationship. My guest is Connie Zweig. Her book, Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, The Dance of Darkness and Light. In our search for awakening, we'll be back with more of Connie after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates, nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Back on Vox Nobis, my guest this week is Connie Zweig. Her book, Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path, The Dance of Darkness and Light in Our Search for Awakening. Connie, what is religious betrayal or spiritual abuse? There's a range of abuse that happens with teachers and students. For some people, it can be a careless touch that can feel like an invasion of privacy, like an inappropriate aggression. For some people, it can be a careless word or glance, a gesture that creates shame in the student or believer. Maybe it's a look of contempt. And then it can be a word. Perhaps the word is loaded for the student. Maybe it was loaded because of some kind of family experience. And then we move into more overt, overtly abusive situations. Sexual assault, for example, which is happening now in a number of the communities that I write about. And again, the response is subjective. So there are some women, let's say, who feel chosen by this, who feel special, who want to turn a relationship, turn it into a relationship, and in some cases, marry the leader. We don't know what the power dynamic is in those marriages if they start out this way, but the women claim that they're comfortable with it, right? And then there are women who are approached sexually by a teacher for whom the assault or the um, or the aggression is really traumatic and they may experience PTSD. They may have nightmares, anxiety, and yet still be unable to leave. I was watching a video yesterday, Victor, of several women who are coming out now in their um, 70s, having been abused by a well-known spiritual teacher in the 1960s and never told anyone. They were seduced. They were told they were special. They were told to keep a secret and never tell anyone. And that's what they did. And here they are in their 70s, kind of facing life completion and mortality and in wanting people to know what happened to them. So 
this, you know, what we're calling religious betrayal or abuse around sexuality can be very different for different people. And then around money. So some people don't mind giving money to the teacher. It can be very, it can start in a very kind of subtle way. And there's no evidence of financial abuse by the teacher. And then it can move into more aggressive coercion for money. As I said, the teacher wants the person's estate, family estate. They want to cash out the properties. The the teacher starts to buy cars or houses or gold Buddhas or thrones or Rolls Royces, whatever it is. And then at that point, the financial abuse becomes very evident to everybody and it becomes clear that money has become the grail to this teacher. I would say more generally, the abuse of power is often experienced as a betrayal because part of the projection onto the teacher is that he or she is empathic and compassionate and would always do no harm. But if that person powers over the student in whatever way, with threats, um, with manipulation, with demand for secrets. You know, let's say one of the students observes some abusive situation by the teacher, isn't the direct subject of it, but observes it and is told, you know, if you tell, you're going to go to hell. That's abusive power. And It's very common in communities to be told to hold these secrets. So this kind of betrayal is a betrayal of a sacred relationship in which we invest divine properties. We don't tend to acknowledge to ourselves the humanity of the teacher, the flaws, the shortcomings, the limitations of the teacher. And so then the projection pops. If we, if we experience this kind of betrayal or even trauma, then the projection pops and we say to ourselves, well, he can't be enlightened if he's married and having an affair. Or she can't be, you know, the perfect compassionate mother if she's yelling at those students. Or he can't be who he says he is if he's drinking that much alcohol and screaming at somebody. And so whatever the dissolute, whatever the source of the disillusionment, the nature of the shadow that's being expressed, the projection then pops and we're left with the question, who is this person? And that becomes a reflection on us. Who am I? If he's not who I thought he was, then who am I? I'm not so much a special member of a community or a believer in this precious knowledge. I'm a victim. I'm a survivor. I've been duped. I've been used. And then there's an identity crisis that happens and a choice point, a moment in which the choice to stay or leave comes and goes. Sometimes for years, that choice comes and goes. Sometimes it just happens in a moment. I'm out of here. And I'm not prescribing a response for people. I think this is very individual. Some people are going to choose the teachings or the practices over the abuse of the teacher and stay for that reason. Some people are going to find it too intolerable and need to separate and individuate and find find a different path. My sort of guidance here is about what's going on in the shadow, how to attune to how this happened to me so that I don't repeat it, how to attune to what is happening in the teacher that he or she would act this way, what is happening in the community because there are group shadows in these communities Just like there's a group persona with narrow beliefs and feelings, there's a group shadow around the secrets 
and what's getting repressed. And so that question then, who am I and what do I do about it, can cause a terrible crisis, just like a midlife crisis. It's a crisis of meaning and purpose, and it can be very painful for people. I've had clients say to me, I feel betrayed by God. Mm. It's that core. It's that central. I feel traumatized by this teacher in this community. And if I leave, I'll lose everything. All of my friends, my meaning, my teach, my guide, my practices. How can I leave? And there are other people who respond with, I am resilient and this is not right for me and I will leave and find my way. And so it's a very individual response. You begin your book with a call for spiritual awakening. How may we embrace that call? Well, the shadow is not all there is to spiritual life, right? It's what has been left unseen and unspoken, and that's why I focused on it with you. But the central mystery of religious and spiritual life is our connection to the divine. And whether we call that God or spirit, Christ nature or Buddha nature, pure consciousness or transcendental consciousness, whatever we call it, that relationship is the central mystery of our lives if we're seekers. And the intention of that seeking is spiritual awakening, the experience of unity with the source, the experience of the return to God or to the source, the soul's longing for the beloved and its joining with the beloved, which is spoken of in every single lineage in every denomination. And so, as I mentioned, there are many people now who are awakening to higher levels of consciousness. It's actually very exciting. And for me, it's kind of a counterpoint to all the dark negative things that are happening in the world of politics and social justice. And it's interesting that they're happening at the same time. So people are awakening to different levels of consciousness. Some are experiencing an internal witness or observer and recognizing that they are not their minds, they are not their feelings, they are not their stories. The narrative self is always telling us stories, but that's not essentially who we are. And other people are moving beyond that to recognize a unity with living things The interconnectedness of all of life is not just a concept to them, but an internal experience. And other people are moving beyond that to higher levels still. There are many ways to explore this. Ken Wilber writes eloquently about higher stages of awareness. um, In my book, The Inner Work of Age, I explore his work. Ken Wilber's work about spirituality. There are many, many other teachers in every tradition who, if you look at the mystical streams in your tradition, Judaism, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sufism, you will find teachings about higher levels of consciousness. And so you can find a map. And then you find practices to begin to experience this. And that search for awakening can bring great frustration and great gratification. And that's why I call it the dance of darkness and light. You know, we may meet the shadow and we also may experience blissfulness, transcendence, ecstasy, openings to something greater than ourselves. Really, that's the central mystery of human life. My guest, Connie Zweig, her latest book, Meeting the Shadow on the Spiritual Path. Connie, please tell our listeners where they can get your books and find out more about you and your wisdom work. Uh, The books are available in bookstores, on Amazon, on Barnes & Noble, on Books A Million. 
Um, you can find my workshops on connieswag.com. And I'm forming two different kinds of support circles around my books. If you're interested in the inner work of age, send me an email, conniezweig at gmail.com. Please put wisdom circle in the subject line and include your time zone. If you're interested in doing spiritual shadow work with others, please put spiritual shadow work in the subject line and give me your time zone. And in both cases, I will connect you with other people in your area to meet online. These groups are free. They're leaderless. You can set up all the logistics with each other, and I will send you supporting material. Some of these books have, these groups have been meeting now for a couple of years, and they form very intimate friendships. They're aging in community. The spiritual books are just, uh, the spiritual groups are just beginning now. So let me know if you would like to make those connections, and I'd be happy to do that for you. Connie, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your experience and your wisdom. Victor, deep gratitude to you. Take care of yourself. And thank you for joining us on Vox Novus. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week.